So hello and welcome. We're going to get started in just a, just a moment or two. Um, just wanted to thank you for, for tuning in early. Um, and we'll be getting started right at the top of the hour. Okay, everybody. Hello and welcome. My name is Marilee Prophet, Senior Manager for the OCLC Research Library Partnership. And I want to thank you for joining us for today's webinar on transitioning to the next generation of metadata. Something all of our speakers today had in common was a desire to incorporate a land acknowledgement as part of this virtual gathering. This presents a challenge as we are all speakers and attendees in different places and the technology we use similarly flows over and across a multitude of landscapes. We all express gratitude towards those who are here before us and seek to learn more in paying respects to and honoring these people. We invite you to join with us in reflection, knowledge seeking, and appreciation. Uh, so before we get started, I have just a few meeting logistics to cover. To eliminate background noise and to make it easier to hear the presenters, right now you are in a listening only mode during the presentation. We are going to somewhat break with tradition and invite you to, um, to join in the conversation if you are comfortable with that. Um, uh, you can, um, when we get to the Q&A portion of the conversation, you can raise your hand and I will unmute you. This is very much an experiment and we'll just uh, see, see how that goes today. Um, our primary form of communication is uh, via chat. So um, uh, if you have any problems throughout the webinar, you can submit a chat message to me. Uh, I'm the host and I will do my best to help you. Um, we will be uh, taking uh, questions at the end after our panel has presented. Um, and we do invite you to submit questions as we go along. To get warmed up, I'm going to ask everybody to find their chat window, which is at the bottom of the screen. There's an icon there that's labeled chat. And go ahead and um, introduce yourselves. Let us know um, where you are attending from. Um, and then uh, if you uh, just be sure that the option is set to everyone before you hit send, this will ensure that the panelists and the attendees can see your question. On a final note, we are recording this webinar and we will make the recording available online afterwards as well as the slides so that you'll have an opportunity to watch it again or share with your colleagues. And so with those housekeeping details attended to, I want to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees from this webinar, of this webinar, are from the OCLC RLP, and I want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work. These are crucial to our success. Um, so I am thrilled to welcome all of our presenters today, uh, but most especially um, our uh, host for the day, uh, Karen Smith Yoshimura, who is going to be um, leading, kicking things off, and introducing the rest of our speakers. Um, so I want to invite Karen to take it away. Do I, let's see if I have the, um, okay. Um, here I am, sorry. So yes, here I am. Um, I'm the senior program officer that will do the introduction for this. Uh, first, I'd like to present some background on the OCLC Research Library Partners Metadata Managers Focus Group. Um, they were the fodder for this report. And at one point we had representatives from 62 OCLC Research Library partners in 11 countries spanning four continents. Um, now, the discussions and responses to question sets over the last six years, 2015 to 2020, um, which is covered in the report, provided the fodder for the fodder for the report. Um, when I counted all of the responses, um, the compilations, that was 777 pages of response compilations that served as the basis for 93 hours of discussions. Now, some of these discussions um, spun off working groups 
um, and they publish the results of their investigations. Uh, two examples of these are the registering researchers in authority files in 2014 and addressing the challenges with organizational identifiers and ISNI in 2016. All of the discussions and focus group responses were summarized on our Hang Together blog, and 36 of them were published in this six-year period. So I did a meta-synthesis of all of this and categorized them into these five sections of the report. The transition to linked data and identifiers, describing the inside out and facilitated collections, the evolution of metadata as a service, preparations for future staffing requirements, and the impact. The report includes 148 citations, not just to the Hanging Together blog post, but to other OCLC research reports and references to the focus group members um, that they included in their responses to the question sets. Our discussion panel today features three of the focus group members who served on the planning group and initiated some of the topics covered by the report. And in the chat window, Marilee has a link to see how many of you have actually read all of the report, some of the report, or haven't yet read the report. And I'll be interested in the responses, which as we are as we all will. So to introduce our discussion panel, first will be Stephen Hearn, the metadata strategist at the University of Minnesota, followed by Suzanne Pilsk, the head of the metadata department at the Smithsonian Libraries, and Roxanne Missingham, university librarian at the Australian National University. So with that, I turn it over to Stephen. Thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you to OCLC Research Libraries Partners for arranging this. Um, I'm going to talk about the transition to linked data and identifiers. We come out of a, an experience with authority control, uh, <clears throat> which is to say managing text strings to represent uh, person, corporate bodies, topics, works, etc. And as long as one could create a text string and a marked record, you were good. Um, if you got training, you could create a text string and an authority record, and that would govern what would be used in uh, catalog records. And they would be easy to index strings, easy to present in a display, but they're harder to maintain in an open shared environment. A text string for one person can easily match the text string for a different person if you're just constructing them in the course of catalog. Mm. And that's inevitable in an open environment that there will be names coming in that are outside the domain of the authority file. So there's a real stability problem with uh, managing entities and their relationship to resources with text strings. Um, there's also a problem within the domain that is controlled because as new names come in, it becomes necessary in some cases to assign the same name to some other entity because that's the way you can differentiate them. And then you have a real problem when those controlled forms go matched against uh, incoming BIP forms. Identifiers uh, promise much more stability. An identifier is unique within its domain, it has uh, a better chance of, of being around for a long time. Uh, and in a linked data environment, the identifier is actionable. It's a URI, it's a URL. And that right there gives us reason to pause and think how stable have URLs proved to be. They are unambiguous. You don't get a a choice when you search by a URL, you get a web page, it's specific, but we know that sometimes they are reused by other pages. But it's as good as anything we've come up with so far. The identifier then strings together the things we want to say about an entity. We can attach, associate the preferred name and variant names for the entity with that identifier. We can associate related entities with that identifier. We can associate attributes of the entity identify it, help make it more recognizable with the entity, and resources that are related to the entity, and string all of that together. Some of that may be in the authority records, some of it may be in BIP records, 
Remember, the identifier is the identifier, and if it appears in the BIP record, it's still part of the metadata for that entity. We can also uh, construct not just strings, name strings to represent people, but informative brief displays using the attribute and relationship data that we have associated with the identifier. So it becomes uh, <clears throat> an actual object of search, not just a, a name, but uh, a name with content, with identifiable content about it, around it. Um, I want to move a slide. There. Here's an example of Maya Angelou's um, many forms of name. Just another reason why name strings are problematic. But also many identifiers because the same entity can be represented in multiple domains, multiple environments where the unique identifier. Uh, makes that individual thing uh, retrievable with all its metadata. And uh, one recent announcement is that the uh, moratorium that has been imposed in LCPCC on the use of EO24 to record identifiers from other resources has been lifted. And there are guidelines now published uh, to help us in making decisions about which identifiers and how many to add to authority records, but this is uh, renewing the goal of not simply uh, having an identifier for the description we create, but linking that identifier to the identifiers in other domains, which may contain more information or different information from what we have offered. Um, And here is a, a chart of uh, degrees of interest in various kinds of equity, diversity, inclusion goals uh, that was done in 2017. And it's notable that the metadata uh, has not, is not recorded here as being a site of a lot of activity to meet EDI goals, though there's a lot of intent indicated in the tall yellow line. Um, I think in part this may be related to uh, the fact that there's already been a history, and certainly in LC practice, of attending to these kinds of concerns. You, you can look at the changes, the headings that are now for African Americans, for, for various disabled people, um, the, the updates to place names, there has been a sort of ongoing effort to try to keep the vocabulary of LCSH uh, and LCNAF current. Um, at the same time, given the complexity of authority control and the complexity especially of managing subject headings in a synthetic vocabulary, uh, it has been uh, slow and, and bottlenecked by editorial practices. As we expand the availability of terms that are have identifiers and control domains, we, we open up options for uh, lo loosening up some of the bottlenecks that can happen in, in a fairly limited set of vocabularies. Last, um, the transition from using strings to using identifiers uh, entails uh, more use of persistent identifiers, uh, the stuff I've already talked about, between the differences between authority control and identity management. And I want to especially focus on the linked data challenges, um, which I think are nicely uh, summarized in uh, Karen's report, which I do encourage everyone to read. Um, as we do cross-domain linking, as we link the identifier for a person in LCNEF to a person in ISNI, we need to be concerned about differences that the two domains may have in how they define an entity. If one domain sees a person and all their pseudonyms as one entity and another domain actually establish separate entity 
descriptions for each you know, author of a given body of work in the pseudonym sense, then you can have uh, a, a challenge. The, the notion of everything being sort of, of everybody having one shared ontology doesn't really come through when you look at the way different domains define entities. Um, there's the issue of systems actually keeping up with the shift to linked data uh, to provide their services. Systems have been built around MARC for a long time, and it will take some re-engineering to, to recreate the kind of services we offer people now in terms of being able to search and find resources in a linked data uh, environment. Um, ensuring that the domains we use are timely and responsive to uh, concerns and to the arrival of new information, that has yet to be demonstrated, uh, though the, the work we can see now in Wikidata is, is very promising in terms of being able to put things out very quickly in a, in a general way, in, a, in an open way. Um, there's the question of what capacity we will have to manage all these entity descriptions, to link them together. Clearly, we'll have to do a lot of it with algorithmic processes, but algorithms only get us so far, and there will be a need for human review and human intervention. Um, the British Library is working on, on working with uh, publishers to try and move the creation of metadata earlier in the production chain, so that rather than just taking Onyx records and trying to make the best mark out of we can, or whatever format we use, to encourage a more standards-based approach to metadata uh, at the origin point so that uh, we have less cases where people all over the library environment are correcting something that is inadequate as it comes from its source. And this points up the value of metadata as a common good, which ideally would be accessible the way Wikidata is accessible so that we could share the work of maintaining and improving metadata. And that's about all I had to say. So I will advance the slide one more time. And I believe it's Suzanne next. Yeah. It is. Hi. Um, I want to thank you. And uh, I want to tell everybody that I've really enjoyed the discussions over the years of this group. It's a, it's a fabulous group where we get to cover um, all things that we are struggling with together and, and share. Um, and uh, actually, some of what we've discussed has turned into the majority of my own work um, and what I would like to discuss in this next section. I wanted to share the part of the report that addresses the discussion around inside out or facilitated collections. Over the years, we have seen a clear addition of expectations of our library metadata team members. And Lorcan's blog post labeled this shifting emphasis. But first, let me acknowledge my way of defining our traditional work, which has been describing the materials that we brought, yes, bought, into our collections from outside sources vendors and publishers, things like electronic resources and databases, with the purpose of assisting our clientele in doing the work they do. They teach, learn, and research. But what Lorcan dubbed inside out refers to the exposing the outputs of our home institution to be found and used, pushing the scholarly outputs up to the world. Now, services for libraries have been identified, and some places have adopted them and adapted them into the former traditional cataloging sections. This inside out has some very con common attributes that make that makes it make sense. Metadata description for discovery and access. But it can morph also into some uncomfortable tasks, such as a new look at scholarly impact tracing, metrics, and comparison points. This inside out and the bundling uses necessitates examination of the division of administrative responsibilities within the library organization structure and who takes on some of these responsibilities in the academic system writ large. 
But getting back to the commonality of CAS, the shift of metadata services has been to support the creation, curation, and discoverability of institutionally created resources. Over time, these trends and experiments, which I truly believe continue to be learning opportunities, point to some major issues we all face, such as data integrity and data syncing, scalability, collection development, identifiers, linked data, open access, all the buzzwords you can think of that are, are tied truly to the activities and these challenges. For example, research data management. The OCLC RLP Metadata Managers Group has discussed for quite some time this growing need at our home institutions for librarian skill sets to in advocating, leading, or assisting in this growing area of responsibility. Our expertise in metadata standards and identifiers, linked data, data sharing, all those things, as well as technical systems, has proven to be invaluable to the research life cycle. It has to be noted that the OCLC RLP group is quite inclusive discussion group. As this call actually demonstrates, it's a very international makeup, and in discussing research lifecycle management, clearly highlighted national context. The differences in infrastructures, mandates, and funding requirements, I would like to say incentives, can cause some jealousy in places where getting cooperation has been quite challenging. So this inside out necessitates the collaboration with data producers and holders or owners of the materials, metadata specialists and system developers and people who are funding it. And yes, each come with a different perspective, a challenge for sure. And it is important to ensure that data creators feel that their needs are met, that there is respect for the intention of the projects while also providing access to the diverse audience that may not have been initially thought of during the creation of the data and the metadata. This exposing of information, this shift, has traditional library tech services librarians discussing more challenging areas and formats. Mentioned in the report were discussions on archival collections, archiving websites, audio and video collections, image collections, and, as I said, research data. In our discussions over the years, this group shared our work with managing, creating, and recreating metadata and resources in an extensive variety of systems. The library catalog, of course, archive management systems, digital and preservation systems, the institutional repository, research management systems, discovery, layers, all kinds of things. And the discussion of the group found pain points in common. We discussed what our colleagues were doing that our own institutions might not have yet begun to experience, but we could see the writing on the wall, and it was a great opportunity to share. Besides the newly created and scholarly outputs of our institution, this concept of inside out also covers that what sometimes is referred to as hidden collections, collections of materials that are unique to our home institutions, exposing these collections, pushing our inside local collections to the outside world beyond the previously known audience. Let's see if I can advance the slide. There we go. One area discussed were our institution's unique archival holdings. Archives have had more autonomy than libraries within institutions because they have unique collections. They have their own needs, such as their own population of users, their own metadata standards, and their own systems. But the opportunity to do more inside out provi provides primary sources for new knowledge creation. Increasing the visibility of these collections reaps significant benefits for scholars previously unintentionally excluded and bringing positive exposure to the home institutions. The relatively recent, I guess, um, now it's getting to be not so recent, SNAC project has brought up many of these hidden internal gems to be shared outside our institutional walls. Libraries can and do benefit from this exposed information, like the number of personal names in archival collections, which can be so large, possibly uncontrolled and without identifiers. However, within context, information that archives provides for, for people, persons, organizations, entities, enrich the information provided in traditional authority files, and vice versa for sharing exposing library authority work to archival systems. The report highlights discussion around another inside collection that benefits from facilitated push to outside our home landscape. 
audiovisual collections and image collections have very unique issues, including metadata granularity. Descript descriptions may and often do lack detailed description and administrative data required for storage, archiving, and viewing, and there is the often lamented duplication or redundancy of metadata at scale, causing the inability to depict differences at item level. Depending on the nature of the collection and its users, questions arise concerning the identification of works, depiction of entities, chronology, geography, provenance, genre, subject, the ofness and the aboutness. What, um, what facilitating these inside collections offer are opportunities for crowdsourcing and interdisciplinary research. Within our home institutions, these inside resources are stored on a vast array of systems and often there are extreme challenges to getting access to these, these systems, either to build a discovery layer or to produce internal federated search access. Recent discussion in the OCLC RLP group has brought up the need for an internal cross-searching needs at our academic homes to leverage our own internal expertise, sharing amongst ourselves to improve our exposure to the outside. OCLC continues to work on ways to assist in exposing and improving understanding of our hidden collections. Check out the work that's been done and continuing to be done on IIIF, the Interoperability Image Framework, the Linked Data Projects earlier mentioned, Wiki, and the Research Data Investigations. The increased reliance on electronic and digital resources during the COVID-19 pandemic will likely accelerate institutions digitizing their archival and distinctive collections that have been available only in physical form. We've seen a great in increase in our use of our digital objects. The increased pressure for openness in publishing and research data will expose the need for data integrity and compatibility leading to adoption of global unique identifiers across disciplines and formats. Libraries are finding that the skills they have are adaptable to the needs of these evolving responsibilities, exposing those insides for the outsides to discover. And so I believe now I hand it over to Roxanne. Jimmy? Hello, everyone. Hello, Roxanne, me? yes. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, so I want to start by saying thank you very much to the Research Library Partnership, to everyone who has contributed to, through our surveys, to Karen for her leadership, and to the panel for having members of the uh, group for having really provocative and challenging conversations for many years. Uh, I start by recognising the Indigenous people on whose lands and airways we meet today joining OCLC in that. I am on the land of the Ngunnawal people and I pay respect to their leaders, past, present and emerging. So I'm going to provide a bit of a summary of points in the section on metadata as service and also give you a flavour of the deep discussions we had and the many issues that we see as challenging and requiring different thinking about us, uh, the consortia like OCLC and the nature of changing client needs and opportunities. So the underpinning concept for the work that we did in relation to metadata as a service was that at the heart, what one of our major roles is, is about unlocking collections that we have developed over thousands of years and actually using that knowledge to build diverse opportunities to both engage with uh, collections and materials, but also to actually think about knowledge itself and to evaluate and uh, build knowledge systems, understanding the metadata life cycle from creation to use of the resource or use of metadata itself. So both have value. So metadata is the use. We collect metadata. Um, you've heard uh, Suzanne talk about uh, collecting it from publishers and authors. We aggregate, add contextual knowledge, and recreate the attributes of metadata. And we, included in that is work that we do to manage collections and enable our users and potential users to harness the knowledge of our collections and indeed the collections of others. The sort of third principle that we had, so the first principle was uh, 
it's fundamentally the glue. Second is that data is for use. The third is that uh, sharing data and creating new value from data really can open up opportunities in our modern world. As we've talked about, there are many ways that our data goes down pathways to connect institutional repositories, discovery layers, archive systems, extraction for learning management systems. And this means that we are um, able to think about the benefits that reuse of that data can make in a new and a different way. And we see that as an ongoing challenge for all of the communities in galleries, libraries, archives, museums, and consortia, and indeed data creators. Opportunities uh, have been the theme of our discussions over um, the eight years that I've been privileged to be a member. And one of those is about data provenance. So in MARC, we have extraordinary layers of information that is very detailed and generally speaking, pretty accurate. We can be proud of our record. So how we know and, and can track our collection to preserve and protect through provenance is a real opportunity. In the paper, we talk about the opportunity for tracking theft, uh, particularly around rare books where every item often of a rare book has been published slightly differently with additional front material or end material. And it is in fact metadata that can help us protect our collection and preserve for the future. Another major theme for us has been the discussion of co-creation and ownership of metadata. So, Libraries have traditionally created the metadata, as have archives, uh, but opening up the new world through um, crowdsourcing really lets us think about opportunities to make that visible, particularly also through using new technology. So we have wonderful, wonderful example of the National Library's Indigenous Language Codes. Um, in the past, we would have had uh, fabulous resources such as Ausbib, the Linguistic Bibliography of Australian, Aboriginal Australia and the Torres Strait Islanders, which is now a text-based system um, managed by the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. But text really doesn't uh, engage with a number of our potential users. So the work that was done through this um, a crowdsourced solution really was able to uh, bring to life the connections that we can make through our collections, um, Indigenous uh, interests and a community of people who want to help make that knowledge more accessible and it's just a fabulous example. I also wanted to talk about the way that you see in the paper we are actually thinking about new communities and different communities using our data. Um, whether they're industry, the wonderful Hachette uh, river of authors, or whether they are other creative opportunities. We don't talk about this in the paper, but um, the University of Technology Sydney had some fabulous examples when they had artist, uh, artist, an artist in residence. They used a radio tuner, an old fashioned radio tuner, so uh, visitors to the exhibition could tune the radio to a channel and browse the Dewey spectrum and then be told what books were in that part of Dewey. They also used an old Bakelite vintage telephone with a directory booklet and um, users could dial the Dewey number of the collection between 000 and 999 to connect to a book from that part of the collection. It even allowed them to do that randomly. Um, other experiments that we see can take metadata and connect records. For example, Jason Insor in his PhD uh, put together more than 13,000 records from the Australian National Bibliographic Database, 23,000 records from the British Library Catalogue to actually build a picture of Australian novels published in Sydney and London during the 20th century that gives us different insights into the nature of the publishing industry. And with our interest in giving value to industry in our universities, um, it really gives us an opportunity to explore how it is because of the metadata that knowledge about industries can be unpacked and delivered in new and innovative ways. 
So coming to the end of my my talk, I'd, I really wanted to go back to a lot of discussions we had about the nature of ownership of metadata and the sharing of metadata and suggest to you that this is actually really quite a philosophical uh, issue and that fundamentally we were really talking about the epistemology as well of knowledge uh, and sharing that knowledge in new and different ways. And I just want to go back to Socrates. You may remember Socrates told the story, he didn't write things down, uh, to Aristotle of famous and food, where he said, um, O oh, most expert Thuth, one man can give birth to the elements of an art, but only another can judge how they can benefit or harm those who will use them. And since you are the father of writing, your affection for it has made you describe its effects as the opposite of what they really are. In fact, it will introduce forgetfulness into the soul of those who learn it. They will not practice using their memory because they will put their trust in writing. There are many more words in this section. But what I wanted to emphasise is that when we've been looking at metadata, we haven't been thinking about trapping knowledge. In fact, what we've been doing is thinking about how we can unleash it so that it can be used in new and different contexts that will in fact fulfil, if you like, the epistemological vision of uh, Socrates of knowledge being um, liberated and used and created with individual interaction in new and different ways. Finally, I want to summarise a lot of the discussions that we had around metadata as a service as being about principles, processes and practicalities. So we really tried to unpack the principles behind metadata and, and the needs not just of libraries but of different communities to have access to knowledge and also metadata as a resource in itself to understand um, publishing, understand the nature of knowledge within different disciplines. We looked at processes to see how those connections might be challenged and how we might think about different ways of uh, bringing those processes together. We were incredibly grateful to the work of people filling in our surveys to give us different insights and in terms of practicalities, thinking about what might be some operational ways to do that in the future. And that gave us really an opportunity to start exploring AI and how that might actually allow us to responsibly create, co-create and liberate data, uh, knowledge through the metadata that we are creating. So that's my contribution to this um, seminar. Thank you. And I didn't move the page on. You've done that. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I know it's back to me. Um, so all of this has impl the implications of the transition of metadata also has implications for staffing. And that has generated a lot of discussion over the years. Um, agreement that a culture shift is needed from pride and production alone to valuing opportunities to learn, explore, and try new approaches to metadata work. Uh, we also uh, talked about the various learning opportunities that are there for staff, the new tools and skills that are needed, um, self-education, and addressing staff turnover. So I'm going to invite the panelists now to chime in on this uh, because I don't have metadata specialists reporting to me. Uh, or working directly um, in a collection, but the panelists do. Um, who wants to speak first? Just unmute yourself. Or I'll ask uh, Roxanne, since she's a university librarian, she must be dealing with staffing all the time. So it's interesting in universities, we talk about both skills and what we should be doing and differentiate that around the different services that we offer. So one of the opportunities for us is the range of different systems that we store the metadata in. So we've got repositories, we have archive systems, we have library catalogues. Um, and we, we unpack innovation. I mean, we've done GIS maps around material that's in archives and also one of our uh, digitised collections of um, images. And we're likely to do more of those. 
So really it's about how do we create partnership skills in some way uh, of the metadata staff with those that are creating the digital humanities interfaces that I think offers us, has offered us a lot of opportunity to discuss things. Um, it's changed so enormously because we get so many records from suppliers that are publisher records or supplier created records. And I think I would summarise the feedback we have had from the group and from all of those that filled in surveys to say it is highly variable. And while we may, for budgetary reasons, have to reduce the number of staff that we have available, it's about how do we prioritise and, and build up strengths to think about how we can apply the expertise we have in new and different ways. Stephen, you have your hand up. Yeah, uh, I was just reflecting that when I started my, my career as a paraprofessional in libraries, catalogers were people who sat in their cubicles and typed or hand wrote work forms to be handed off to the person who would work on them or those computer terminal machines. And now I have colleagues who are massaging massive amounts of data or creating Python scripts that can, you know, swap out or extend data that's in records in a match mode. And that's that's becoming really, really important because of the volume of, of metadata we're trying to wrestle with and, and because we're not just doing one thing at a, one, one resource at a time. We're trying to maintain databases with thousands, billions of records. So I, I think in terms of the skills needed, you know, both the ability to work with a variety of computer programs and the ability to think in terms of massive amounts of data and the kinds of order you can create with it are, are real changes. And Suzanne? Just to build off of that, um, I, I think we're seeing that people with the sensitivity of understanding library data, the uses of metadata, the importance of discovery and reuse is something that um, librarians bring to the table that the technology partners that we have don't understand, and so we have to translate a lot. So what Stephen was saying about how we have this massive amount of data and we're, we're processing things, and we have staff that are now have to not be um, scared of technology. They need to be able to experiment with open refine or, um, and not just do the the rote work that has that used to be technical services um, of just filling out a mark a mark record, which of course was not just a mark record, but it was, but that is not what we do anymore. We we have to be able to do um, mass manipulation. We need to understand when we make those changes what the effect has, and when technology people make some changes, we need to be able to to review it and see the impact of their changes on what the goal is of our of our metadata. So we could talk more about that in the Q&A, but I do want to just summarize the report's conclusion that the work underway at OCLC on the shared entity management infrastructure um, and the focus group's expectation that it will address many of the challenges documented in the report around persistent identifiers, especially providing language neutral links to trustworthy sources. The next generation of metadata will become even more focused on entities rather than record-based descriptions of an institution's collections. But a key takeaway is good linked data requires good metadata. Hmm. And, um, and, and that's the basis. And you're all doing good metadata out there. So thank you so much for all your contributions over the years. Um, and Marilee, maybe this is the time to start sharing the results of some of those polls. Sure, that sounds like a great idea. Um, I also want to invite people um, as, uh, as we're doing this um, to, uh, to go ahead and answer uh, enter questions or observations into chat. You can also um, uh, raise your hand and I will um, unmute you. It's hard for me to do multiple things at the same time. Um, so I'm 
sharing uh, the wrong thing. Um, so we did three polls. Uh, the first one, I'm going to just switch polls here for a second. Um, the first poll that we did was how many people attending the webinar have read uh, the report? Um, and a good portion of people are, oh, now people are revising their their answers. This is the this is now the active the active poll. Um, so we have kind of a, a, a nice split here. Uh, people who are familiar with the content in the report, um, people who've uh, taken a look at particular parts of it, and people who have this in their pile of intentions. Um, Suzanne talked about the um, uh, the uh, um, the inside out collection, and we asked people to um, tell us where they've been involved uh, from a metadata perspective with inside out collections. Not surprisingly, we see that um, a third of people have uh, been involved in, um, in in archival collections, and there's a, a range of other things, right, that would also potentially fall within um, archival collections, AV collections, image collections, uh, a mix of things, and people could choose all that apply here. Um, very few people uh, had who responded to the poll, at least, um, had engaged in none of the above, so a little bit of a learning opportunity. And then finally, and I'm going to just end by keeping this poll open, um, this is a poll where we seeded it with four questions, um, uh, but then also invited you to add your own, and here you can upvote ideas. So this is kind of a forward-looking um, uh, slide, which topics are you most interested in and would like the OCLC Research Library Partner Metadata Managers Focus Group to focus on in the future. And I am going to see if I can find where my chat went off to and uh, and, take and, a look. And, yeah, yeah, go, go ahead, I just wanted to let you know it's, uh, it's Mercy over here, and I've just been monitoring chat. Um, nothing specifically has come up in here, so I don't know if that's um, – um, but I am – Perusing, I'm perusing now, and I can uh, verbalize some questions to you or to the panelists, um, right. which I'm seeing. Uh, Nicola um, has entered into chat, um, um, and her comment is, I'm also interested in views on data sovereignty, as we have a current question mm -hmm. about using a tool that looks really useful for a project but is cloud-based. Does anyone else have experience with this? And I'll start by the panelists uh, and see if um, you have any answers or thoughts on that. And also invite our, uh, our attendees here uh, to share their experiences or thoughts about resources to pursue. This is Stephen. I, I think it really varies with the nature of the resource. I know we, we put up research data sets, and one of the keys to getting that on campus was making it possible for the creator of the research data set to ask to moderate requests to download the data. So there, there was a real interest in individual control over distribution. Um, I don't think that's quite as true when we get to uploading on our yearbooks for the last, whatever, 150 years. <laughs> Uh, but but for certain things, there is going to be a real concern and, you know, have security and have some control. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for your thoughts on that. Completely understand what Nicola means, and I was wondering if she could sort of explain to me what she means about um, data sovereignty exactly. Are you willing to be unmuted? <laughs> and Nicola, let us know if you'd be uh, willing to have us unmute you, or you could uh, clarify a bit via chat. All right. And Marilee, I think you as host might be able to. Yeah, I'm just gonna. Um, I'm just gonna. Uh, uh, let's see. Let's let's go ahead and allow Nicola to. Let's see. I I 
think, Nicola, you may be able to speak now. Or maybe not. This is why it's an experiment. Um, well, Stephen, since you already answered, um, can you say what, how you would define data sovereignty? Oh, she says she's speaking. It's not working like I expected it to, aren't it? Um, uh, we did. We just just to add um, for uh, for a second on this. Um, one of the uh, we did a webinar recently on the um, care principles. Do I have that? Yeah, yes, right. the, yeah. Care, yeah. not not fair, yeah. but the care yeah. the, the care. care principles on yeah. indigenous data sovereignty, um, which is a a particular issue. Um, so I'm not sure. Uh, and then Carol is asking. Thank you, Carol. Um, yes. So metadata, including knowledge, which has come from indigenous communities. Um, and I don't know if the speakers in that. So uh, we can put into chat. Um, we had a, a webinar on that topic, and I don't believe that the uh, speakers covered things like cloud-based services, um, but uh, uh, it's um, certainly an interesting question and something that we are tracking here as there's interest in, um, you know, not only respectful and appropriate description uh, about materials, but also um, appropriate uh, stewardship of data related to uh, to those people. So thank you so much for that question. And thank you, Lucy, for the link. Just commenting on, on University of Minnesota experience in this particular regard, we have the Ojibwe People's Dictionary, which was a project put together by uh, the Ojibwe people in Minnesota in, in specific tribes and the university's uh, Native American Studies Department in the academic side and then the libraries doing the, the programming to get it all mounted up. And, you know, it's, it's a really wonderful thing, the Ojibwe People's Dictionary, but it's, it's also a, an area of real sensitivities. And there has been a lot of, you know, care taken to ensure that the, 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 the Native peoples who are contributing their, their recordings and their images and their, their wisdom to it are uh, represented as, as offering it as something of them and, and having uh, a significant measure of control. At the same time, we have scholars who feel like their contributions are really important. So politically, it can be, uh, and socially, it can be a, a, a delicate dance to get into. But it, the product is really nice. So yeah, this is a, a real touchy issue at the Smithsonian. We have the um, National Museum of uh, American Indian. We also have the, in the Natural History Museum, we have an anthropology department. And they are completely separate um, entities <laughs> underneath the Smithsonian umbrella. So in the library, we are very, very sensitive and turn to our colleagues for um, advice and, and clarity on, on what we should be doing. If, if that is what we're, if that's what the question meant about what can be seen and seen by who and as we produce um, more and more data as open um, access data. If you're talking about a cloud, cloud port, uh, platform for owning the metadata and not having someone reuse it, at least my institution, we are very open with our metadata. So once we set something out to be free, we let it be free. So if it's on a cloud-based system, um, the only issue we have is uh, firewall security issues to make sure that the data that is out in the public is allowed to be out in the public. So um, if I wasn't, I just wasn't sure which way this topic was going. The cloud platform threw me. Yep. So I might make a comment as well because I think this is a really interesting example of how um, we in our roles in libraries now need to be aware of and interact with possibly a whole lot of other parties within our, in our institutions, with cybersecurity experts, with privacy experts, uh, with data governance people, so that we're, if you like, co-managing 
and co-deciding what is the appropriate fit for our institution around a range of different materials. And it is that expertise in metadata that gets us to the table and helps us be a part of the solution. But often, particularly in terms of you know, cloud solutions, for example, if we're going to store material or metadata, there are decisions and evaluations that need to be made with other technical experts. So it, um, one of the things we bring, I think, is knowing that with metadata we share and we um, use a range of different systems that we're, we're used to having to um, think about how it works in a wider world uh, based on standards, but now we're thinking about how it needs to work in a wider world based on often our organisational um, technological solutions, risk providers, and as Suzanne says, the sensitivity of the resources themselves. It has been it has been an incredible learning experience to from when I started library work and metadata description to where we are now. When to to be sensitive to uh, um, how it how it can what the privileges that are assumed. So anyway. Uh, just taking a, qu a moment there to advance the slide so that um, you have everybody's names and contact information. We do have a couple minutes left. I am scanning uh, to see if there's any more questions or uh, raised hands, um, other things of that sort. Um, if you go back to the results of your of the third poll, Marilee, it does seem like the transitioning to the to link data and especially identifiers was um, was the uh, well now I can't sell. Okay, so that that seemed to be like the number one issue, but also preparing for future staffing requirements with. Aunt, sort of tied with evolution of metadata as a service. So if there's any specific top uh, questions about those areas that you'd like us to pursue, anyone of the participants? I know the focus group loves talking about linked data, especially Stephen. He loves talking about identifiers. Well, and we can. We are we're having another version of this conversation um, next week in an earlier time to accommodate uh, folks from um, uh, the um, the uh, UK and Europe. Uh, so we'll have some additional input there, and we can take this all back to our metadata managers focus group for um, for further fodder. Not seeing anything else at this time, uh, and I do want to be respectful of, of everyone's time here. Um, we also wanted to take a moment here, uh, Roxanne. Yes. So I um, think it's incredibly important at this point in time that we do a really big round of applause for Karen. Karen smith Yoshimiri has been working with the OCLC Research Library Partnerships for over 25 years. I've probably known her for most of those, and she has been amazing. Yep, clap, clap, in terms of her energy, her passion, her knowledge. She's worked with the Library of Congress and the Chinese Character Code for Information Interchange, Chinese Character Analysis Group to develop the East Asian Code, character code set. She's done a lot of pre-Unicode and post-Unicode work. She has a background where she spent nine years in East Asia, primarily in Japan and Taiwan, and holds a degree in Chinese studies from Yale. So she is an international woman. She is just passionate about communicating, ensuring that we talk about metadata, look to the future, uh, unleash the beast that is sitting in all of our library catalogues. She's contributed more than 100 blog posts to Hanging Together, which is truly amazing. 
And when I stalked her on Google Scholar, I can tell you she's got more than 300 citations, an H index of nine, and she is just extraordinary. Karen, it has been a great privilege to be working with you through the Metadata Managers Group and everyone on the group thanks you enormously for the work that you have done. We will miss you, but I am sure you will continue writing enthusiastically about metadata and keep those pictures of your lovely cat coming as well. So thank you, Karen. We really, really, really appreciated everything you've done. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you, Karen. Thank you, uh, Suzanne, Stephen, uh, Roxanne. It has been just a real, a real pleasure to have this conversation uh, with you. I know that the Metadata Managers Focus Group is just an incredibly energetic and enthusiastic bunch, um, and it just w would, would not be the same without Karen's um, leadership. So if you guys are interested in continuing this conversation, we are having another one next week, uh, and we will send around um, the recording to this, the link to the slides, um, and all of that other good stuff uh, so that you can you can watch it again and appreciate. Um, so thank you so much and this concludes today's webinar. Thank you.